Thank you very much, Christoph. It's very nice. I also want to start by thanking um, the, the wonderful artist, Margaret, <coughs> Margaret Barnaby, who who produced a lot of the images that I'm using throughout the talk and has allowed me to use them all over the place. Um, they are, just so you can appreciate them even more, they are really large woodblock um, prints. So she carves big wooden block, uh, big pieces of wood, um, and then puts the paint, applies the paint and then um, prints, runs the canvases over them. So all of that incredible detail has been carved by hand into wood before being printed. Um, and these are, uh, uh, she's, she's done a whole series of works on uh, the crows that I'm going to be talking to you about today. Okay. I stood in the forest listening for crows, listening and hoping even though I knew it was foolish. I'd been led to this forest precisely because there were no longer crows here. Precisely because there were no longer crows anywhere in the island, on the island of Hawaii. I knew that the last sighting of a free-living crow had been made a decade earlier in 2002 and that these birds were now extinct in the wild. But as I stood in the forest, I couldn't help but listen and hope. I begin here with spectral crows haunting a dying forest. This forest was itself in decline for a number of reasons, principally because of the presence of introduced ungulates like pigs that uproot and graze down any new vegetation. Where once there would have been a lush understory beneath a tall canopy of trees, all that remain now are old trees with no new growth to replace them and no understory to hold the soil together when it rained. The biologists I was travelling with called this a museum forest. Others have called it a forest of the living dead. Either way, it too was perched perilously at the edge between life and death. The crows in question here are an endemic Hawaiian species, a forest specialist that eats primarily fruit and flowers. Known locally by their Hawaiian name, Alala, all the remains of this species now is a captive population of roughly 100 birds. There are hopes that conservationists might soon be able to start releasing them back into the forest. In fact, back into the specific forest where I now stood. As we'll see, however, much remains to be done before this is possible. And so, in a range of different ways, this paper is an exploration of the absence of crows, as well as some of the many contestations over and consequences of their potential return. In particular, I'm interested in how we inherit and inhabit the legacies of the past to shape possible futures. These inheritances take many forms, from genetic material and the broader landscapes and ecological communities that we're born into, to the historical events and relationships that we retell, remember and consequently guide our understandings and actions in the world. In a range of different ways, our bodies, our lives and our possibilities carry traces of those who have come before. In, in this context, I'm interested in what it means to live well with ghosts. What would it mean to responsibly take up these inheritances in a time of extinctions? Under the rainforest canopy, wide seed dispersal can be a vital component of survival for plant species. As birds carry seeds away from their parent trees, they spread genetic diversity, they reduce competition, and they can even provide safer places for germination. In the distant past, there were many large birds who carried, carried out this work in Hawaii, but most of them are now long extinct. Until its passing, Alala was the largest remaining fruit-eating bird in the Hawaiian forests. And so it is not surprising that recent research suggests that the Alala may have been the sole remaining seed disperser for at least three plants, Hoava, Halapepe and the Lulu ferns. But dispersal is not just about movement. In addition, it seems that some of these seeds germinate better, or in the case of Huava, will only germinate if the outer fruit has been removed, something that Alala once routinely did. A long and intimate history of coevolution lies within these embodied affinities that bind together avian and botanical lives. Crows are nourished, plants propagated, and in the process both species are, at least in part, constituted. Their physical and behavioural forms, their ways of life, emerging out of generation after generation of coevolutionary interaction. And so since their disappearance, Alala haunt the forest in another way. Their absent presence is inscribed in the landscape. Plants call out to Alala, their fruiting and flowering bodies shaped by past attractions and associations that no longer exist. Co-evolutionary affinities linger in woody flesh to remake forest ecologies. 
As Alala populations have declined over the past decades, the plants bound up in mutualistic relations with them have likely declined too. Halapepe and the Lulu ferns are themselves now rare or endangered. The extent to which the loss of Alala has contributed to the decline of these plant species remains a topic for future study. It's clear, however, that the absence of Alala can only make the future of these plants that much more precarious. Here we see that coevolution can easily switch over into co-extinction, co-becoming into entangled patterns of dying with. But the disappearance of Alala is also felt by local people. For some native Hawaiians, Alala matters as a part of their cultural landscape. These birds hold stories and associations in the world. Alala is an amakua, or ancestral deity for some families. And the plants and forests that might disappear or change without their seed dispersal are themselves also culturally significant in various ways. Many other locals are also drawn into this experience of loss. I've interviewed artists, biologists, ranchers, hunters and others, some of whom are lucky enough to remember and so miss the dramatic presence of these birds in the forest, and many of whom were trying in their own way to reckon with the affective burden of living in a place where crows are no longer present, a place in which, paraphrasing one biologist, we've lost the most intelligent and charismatic components of our forests. Life and death happen in relationships like these. Here crows, plants and people and other species are tangled up and at stake in each other. But it's the distinctly historical character of these entanglements that I'm interested in. More specifically, the way in which life is, at a fundamental level, grounded in rich patterns of inheritance. All of Earth's creatures are heirs to the long history of life on this planet. We are woven through with traces of our past, of the past, our own past, but also that of our forebears, whose relationships and achievements we inherit in our genes, our cultural practices, languages, and much more. In short, this is a world in which, paraphrasing Jacques Derrida, to be is to be haunted. While some of this inheritance is linear from parent to offspring, it's also much more than this. It's radically multivalent and radically multi-species. Who we all are as individuals, as cultures, as species, is in large part a product of interwoven heritages, of generations of co-evolution and co-becoming with all of our multi-species ancestors, what Deborah Bird Rose has referred to as patterns of sequence and synchrony. As it's sometimes succinctly put by native Hawaiians, the people arrived as Polynesians, but the islands made them Hawaiian. As I travelled, observed and talked with a range of people on a recent research trip to Hawaii, I was drawn into another instance of the way in which, even in their absence, Alala was shaping future possibilities for everyone. While the legacies of their past presence are felt by some, including plants, the promise of their future return is also a powerful pressure on forest management policy. Just a few months earlier, the state government had released its management plan for the Kau Forest Reserve, a large area on the southern slope of Mauna Loa on the Big Island. At the core of the plan was a proposal to fence 20% of the reserve, almost 5,000 hectares. The fence section would still allow visitors, but all of the pigs inside would be killed so that the understory might recover. Hopes and dreams for the future of Alala animated this proposal, at least in part. As the forest recovers, it's anticipated that it will be a future release site for the crows, the renewed understory providing food and protection from predators. In addition, the removal of pigs will aid in the conservation of a range of other endangered species, while ensuring that the forest remains a healthy water catchment for local communities, industry and agriculture. But not everyone supported this proposed plan. Although its drafting had involved more than a year of serious community consultation, it had been greeted with hostility by some. The biggest critics were pig hunters, who opposed the building of fences and the removal of the pigs that they hunt. Of course, hunters are a diverse crowd in most places, and this is certainly true in Hawaii. I want to focus here, though, on one specific group of hunters, a group of predominantly native Hawaiians, who have offered the most vocal opposition to the Kau Forest Reserve plan. Many complex factors are at work in their opposition. In particular, there's a strong view that pig hunting is a core part of Hawaiian culture, a view that's now widely disputed by archaeologists and historians, but is still strongly advocated by many of these people. Even more important than the specific place of pigs, however, is the invocation of the history of the occupation of Hawaii. 
It's with the occupation firmly in mind that some of these hunters view the proposed fence as one more land grab in a long history of taking. My central interest here is in the way in which this history is in itself inherited and inhabited to shape life and death possibilities in the forest. As many of you will know, the last monarch of the sovereign nation of Hawaii, Queen Liliuokalani, was overthrown in 1893 by a group of US businessmen with assistance from the US Navy. Through a complex series of events over the next five years, Hawaii became a territory of the United States and 50 years later was made a state. There was some attempt in the lead up to the overthrow of the Queen and afterwards to provide native Hawaiian commoners with property rights in small parcels of land, in part through a process known as the Great Mahele, which, very simply put, converted customary use rights into private property. For a variety of reasons, however, this worked out very badly for most Hawaiians. So that, as Kaolani Kawanui puts it, by the mid-19th century, Hawaiians and their descendants had become largely a landless people. For people inhabiting this history, fence building is never an innocent act. In this context, conservation is seen as one more excuse to take away people's rights to access or use land. As one hunter put it, environmentalists are always using something in danger to the islands to try and grab land. Importantly, these people do not trust the intentions of the government. Viewing any fencing as the beginning of a slippery slope towards complete loss of access. As another hunter put it, environmentalists want to eventually take it all away and fence it in. The alala, watershed, native plants, it's just a smokescreen to grab more land. <coughs> In addition, these arguments by hunters often explicitly challenge the authority of the Hawaiian state government and certainly of the US federal government, illegal governments from this perspective, to exercise any, any authority in the management of these lands and their resources. Once a proposal like the Kau Forest Reserve Management Plan has been framed by critics in this light, to speak in its favour is to simultaneously endorse the occupation. As one biologist put it to me in an interview, to be for the plan is to be for the overthrow. In this context, to speak in favour of conservation, as another Hawaiian, oh, sorry, as a Hawaiian or anyone else, is to enter into what another local called the raging fire of emotion that surrounds the occupation and subsequent colonisation of the islands. In this light, Alala themselves become an enemy of the Hawaiian people. What's more, the birds' movements through the forest become suspect, as hunters fear that each time they go beyond the fenced area, especially if they're nesting, the fence will expand with them. And so Alala becomes a Trojan horse of sorts, whose conservation facilitates further loss of land and rights. It should come as no surprise that in this climate there are real fears that any released birds will be targeted by some hunters. Towards the end of my most recent trip to Hawaii, I met with Hanaki Alani Springer, a kapuna or elder who lives in the district of North Kona on the Big Island. Deeply knowledgeable about Hawaiian history and culture, about hunting and conservation, I was eager to hear her thoughts on the past and future of the islands. Sitting in her living room in her family's old homestead, we talked about conservation, politics, sovereignty, ranching, and of course, alala. Hannah is a passionate and active conservationist, president of the Conservation Council for Hawaii. Like many other people that I spoke with, she felt that in some places, pigs and other ungulates need to be fenced out and removed for conservation. But she also felt that room has to be made for hunters. Her family hunt, in the past she hunted too. And so like other people I spoke to, she felt that the government could do more to facilitate access to existing state land for hunting. In contrast to those Hawaiians who strongly emphasise the place of pig hunting in their culture, however, Hannah noted that the island's forests are alive with a diversity of plants and animals, all of which have their place in Hawaiian stories and culture. In this context, she argued that a singular focus on pigs is not helpful. In her words, we need the larger context that is much more diverse and dynamic. When we so diminish the conversation, we're diminishing the Hawaiian experience and the Hawaiian culture. The forest is important for the myriad characteristics that comprise the whole. Other Hawaiians that I spoke with who shared this view often referenced another history, the Kumulipo, an origin story, in their arguments about the need to hold on to a diversity of plants and animals in the forest. For these people removing pigs from portions of the forest, to aid in the conservation of alala, other endangered birds and plants, and the watershed is essential for the protection of Hawaiian life and culture. 
This is perhaps particularly the case in a place like the Kaiu Forest Reserve, where even if this fence did go ahead, the remaining 80% of the area would still be open to pigs and hunters. Speaking with Hannah that day, I was reminded again and again that the histories that we tell are themselves acts of inheritance. They're modes of not just inhabiting, but inheriting the world. Which is to say that the aspects of the world that we nurture into the future are in part determined by the histories that we tell. There's a dynamic at work here in inheritance that deserves further attention. In For What Tomorrow, Derrida ex excavates the basic structure of inheritance. He's primarily interested in what it means to inherit traditions, languages and cultures. At its simplest level, inheritance seems to be about continuity and retention, about taking up the past and carrying it forward into the future. But this isn't the end of the story. In any act of inheritance, there is also transformation. While language, culture and tradition all continue from generation to generation, they are living heritages, not fixed once and for all. It's this double injunction, this contradictory assignation in Derrida's terms, at the heart of inheritance that he draws attention to. He descri Derrida describes the act of inheritance as one of reaffirmation, which both continues and interrupts. Derrida's basic point here is simple and I think powerful. He argues that inheritance that is mere repetition closes off the future, or rather closes off the possibility of anything genuinely different, and maybe just maybe better. Beyond the cultures and traditions that Derrida focuses on, a similar dynamic also underlies some of the forms of inheritance that fascinate biologists and geneticists. After all, reproduction is not cloning, at least for now, at least for many of Earth's species. In this context, variability and evolution, that great engine of new ways of life, operate in part through precisely this kind of interplay between genetic and extragenetic retention and transformation. Reading Derrida with Darwin, or better yet, with more recent work in developmental systems biology, it's clear that we inhabit a world of biocultural inheritances, a world in which the fundamental structure of life is one of haunting, of being woven through, with and by each other in myriad different ways. And yet for all this we are, of course, never fully defined by these traces. It's in this context that I'm interested in what it means to live up to our inheritances. Of course, transformation and so loss is always a part of any inheritance, where species, ecologies and cultures are in process of ongoing and dynamic change, much of what is and is not passed on is not up to any of us. Where we can and do play a role, however, the question is usually the same. Never simple, never clean. What is to be lost and what retained? Which losses can we accept and in the name of which continuities? It's inside this dynamic I'd like to suggest that responsibility resides. That afternoon, as my conversation with Hannah was coming to a close, we drifted into a discussion of the sovereignty movement on the islands. She told me about a relative deeply committed to sovereignty who worked for the state government as a biologist. When asked about the incompatibility between her politics and her employment, this relative would say that she was conserving Hawaii's biotic diversity so that when and if sovereignty comes, the people and the land are in the best possible condition for it. Although Hannah didn't explicitly state it, it seemed to me that she herself shared this general view. She went on to say, the conclusion that I've arrived at is I'm a citizen of the land. We've lived on this land as I've described to you since before Cook's arrival. And we've seen chiefs rise and fall. We've seen an island nation born and die before its time. Elected and appointed officials come and go. But here we stand. I'm less interested in the constitution that binds us or the flag that flies over the land than I am in the quality of life on the land. So if there are elements within whoever's constitution it is that allow us to preserve and pursue the righteous man of the resources that we call home, then I'm happy to pursue those. I'm loyal to this land. Whatever flag flies over it is one that I'm willing to use the resources of to continue to be a citizen of this land. Hannah's position is, I think, one of hope, within which resides a profound responsibility both to the past and the future. Hannah has not forgotten the events of 1893, the, the occupation, but she wants to inherit this history in a way that refuses to see any support for conservation as necessarily support for an illegal occupation. She wants to inhabit the history of these islands, her and her family's history, in a way that holds open possibilities for flourishing life into the distant future. In short, she's proposing that we might care for Alala and for Hawaiian culture and sovereignty and for the rest of the land and its people. 
While doing so is certainly not straightforward, it is at least possible in a place like the Kau Forest Reserve. Here I think we see that responsible inheritance requires that we engage with others, their histories, their relationships, to hold open a future that does not forget the past and nor does it attempt to reconstruct it, but rather inherits it as a dynamic and changing gift that must be lived up to for the good of all of those who inhabit it. Taking care is always a relational and a historical proposition. If we're doing it right, care always thrusts us into an encounter with ghosts, our own and others. Responsibility resides in a genuine openness to diverse voices with their imagined pasts and futures. But importantly, we're seeing that care and responsibility worthy of the name, as Derrida would put it, necessarily draws us out beyond the limits of a purely human space of inheritance and meaning making. In short, ours aren't the only hauntings that constitute worlds. Some plants live in worlds haunted by Alala, some crows dream of a forest beyond the aviary. Paying attention to diverse voices means recognising that non-humans are not simply resources to be conserved or not, inherited or cast aside, on the basis of whether or not current generations of humans happen to want them around. Rather, Alala, Hoava and others are themselves constituted through immense processes of intergenerational life, the cumulative achievements of multi-species entanglements, adaptations and inheritance. These inheritances, of course, include Alala's vocal repertoires and some other learned skills that are thought to be disappearing after years of captive life. In this context, the ongoing dramas of birds and plants, as well as those of the many other forms of life that have already and might yet still make worlds with them, are worthy of our respect and gratitude. Much is at stake for these non-human others, not just in them at the edge of extinction. Ours is a time of mass extinction, a time of ongoing colonisation of diverse human and non-human lives. But it's also a time that holds the promise of many fragile forms of decolonisation and hopes for a lasting environmental justice. Here the work of holding open the future and responsibly inheriting the past requires new forms of attentiveness to biocultural diversities and their many ghosts. But beyond simply listening, it also requires us to take on the fraught work, never finished, never innocent, of weaving new stories out of this multiplicity. Stories within stories that bring together complex and contested pasts and visions for the future as one part of the vital work of living well with others, of inhabiting the rich patterns of interwoven inheritances that constitute our fundamentally shared world. Thank you.